Joining us now from New York is the Daily Beast, Tina Brown, the new editor-in-chief at Newsweek. And from Los Angeles, Newsweek owner Sidney Harmon, who waited 92 years to get into the media business. Tina Brown, I'll start with you. Newsweek, I think it's fair to say, is a somewhat damaged brand. It lost $40 million last year, and most of its big-name writers have left. How are you going to revive it? Well, I regard Newsweek as a fantastic, legendary brand. And I have this tremendous weakness for fantastic, legendary <laughs> brands, as you know, with you know, Vanity Fair and The New Yorker. And the DNA of that magazine of Newsweek is, is really a, a great, great one. And I'm very excited about it because I think that with the uh, adrenaline and news metabolism of the Daily Beast joining forces with Newsweek's terrific, deep culture of, of news and, and quality, it's a great combination. And the two things are going to animate each other. Now, most magazines, uh, we, as we know, are edited by men. Are you going to try, uh, when you take over, to lure more female readers to Newsweek? Well, I'm very excited about that, I have to say. You know that uh, in the 1970s, the women of Newsweek actually launched a, new, uh, a lawsuit against the management. I remember uh, that. Headed, headed by the great uh, lawyer, Eleanor Holmes Norton, where they actually said that you know, they had to do something about the fact that women were actually barred, really, from the writing editorial process. So, of course, this is a little bit of a sweet revenge. You know, at the Daily Beast, we've brought on a tremendous amount of, of, of uh, new women, sort of op-ed writers, if you like, and we will be getting a lot of great women at, the, at Newsweek. Uh, you know, a lot of great men, too, but I have to say the DNA will just slightly shift. I'm sorry to warn you about that, Sydney, but I know you're in favor of strong women since you're married to one. <laughs> well, I think you'll be getting some, uh, some uh, inquiries now from women who might like to work there. Sydney Harmon, you've invested a significant chunk of change in this magazine. How difficult do you think it will be to turn Newsweek around? It will be difficult. It will be manageable. It will be done. All right. Tina Brown, seem words. Tina Brown seemed to be your first, second, third, and fourth choice for editor. Why was that? I need hardly tell you, Howard, since you work for her, this is an indomitable force. This is the unique talent in journalism, thoroughly established, still gloriously curious, and to use her favorite word, totally animated. That's an irresistible combination. <laughs> Let me ask you, financially, though, uh, with 250 people working at Newsweek, 70 the Daily Beast, now a combined company, is it, is it inevitable, uh, Sidney Harmon, that there'll be some job cuts? It is inevitable that if we merge two organizations intelligently, there will be some modification. I so dislike that emphasis on job cuts. What we're here to do is to produce a stunningly effective combination and to save as many jobs as possible. Tina Brown, these negotiations with you and Sidney Harmon and of course Barry Diller, the uh, chief executive of IAC, your parent company, uh, went on for quite a while. There was a lot of jockeying over who would control what. It fell apart. You said the prenup was too difficult for this marriage and yet here you are this morning. How was this marriage saved? Well, I have to say it was really saved by Sydney because, you know, one of the, the great uh, common denominators in all the discussions really was our sense that Sydney was a person who really cared about journalism. You know, that we know that in taking over Newsweek, he really has done something amazingly courageous because he's basically stuck his neck out and said, I believe in great journalism and I want to protect it. That was always very appealing to me, I have to say, and something that all of us respected hugely. Trying to work out these kind of uh, uh, mergers and things is very complex, whatever companies they are. It is difficult to figure out, you know, in two uh, uh, already existing operations with its own way of doing things, its own sure. culture, how it's going to work. But actually, we did work it out very amicably, and it really actually, you know, people have said it was difficult, it fell apart, but I have to say, I think it was pretty speedy for something as complex as this. Uh, and, and, and I would add, I would add that uh, it was one of those gentle, slight interruptions. Uh, it is seen by many in the media as a reuniting. I don't think we were ever, ever separated. What I like about all of this is that we've had an opportunity to come to really know each other. That's a crucial first step. I think it's fair to say we're all a great deal more comfortable now than when we began. Yes, That's absolutely. very promising. You know, Howie, when we uh, had that final meeting on the Tuesday where we all got together in the same room for the really the first time, as opposed to various members of the team getting together, there was such a great dynamic and such a great sense that here we all are, professionals, 
all of us really wanting to make this work. And it was very thrilling, the whole sort of atmosphere in the room. In terms of your own role, Sidney Harmon, you've said all along you wanted to be a hands-on owner. Uh, what assurances uh, have you gotten that you will have that kind of role? I'm totally comfortable with my role now, Howard. Uh, we are a trio, uh, Tina, Stephen, Culverin, and I. We will work together as a team. I have little concern about how well that teamwork will go. Uh, and as for hands-on, I can't imagine any one of the three of us not wanting to be thoroughly engaged every hour, every day. That's the excitement in this for me. We talk about every hour. Where do you, where do you start getting those 6 a.m. emails from Tina? <laughs> and by the way, Stephen Colvin was the president of the Daily Beast. He will now be the chief executive of this combined company. Uh, Tina, as we mentioned earlier, you were uh, editor of Vanity Fair, which is a monthly. You were the editor of The New Yorker, which is a weekly. But the industry, the magazine industry, was healthier then. You now have to do more with less, given the economics of the business, in which a lot of magazines have either uh, uh, gone by the wayside or shrunk dramatically. Absolutely, but that's really where uh, having done, uh, edited the Daily Beast for the last two years has been such a fantastic uh, shifting of the mindset. You know, we've, we've really operated in a completely different economic structure to the kind of structures that we used to have in the old kind of days when magazine was such a rich uh, business. Right. We really got used to working with younger writers, with, with writers who, you know, on a different scale who make writing part of the several things that they do in terms of budget. And also I think what's great about having worked exclusively online with really hardly a thought for print in the last two years is that we kind of look back on the world of print almost with the eyes of an expatriate sort of looking at the old country. We understand very much what we miss. We understand also what it didn't have and what has happened since. And so I think we can bring the kind of energy that we've developed at the Daily Beast and all the sort of multimedia platform sense, as it were, to the reinvigoration of Newsweek. And I think to have that experience is really quite invaluable, to have such a different range of skills as represented by the Beast staff, which we can actually then integrate with the terrific talent at Newsweek. And there really is a lot of talent. You know, one of the things that I love is having gone over there uh, on Friday, I can already sense uh, the people in the room. There's so many good people there, and I, I, I hope to do what I did at the New Yorker, which was really to uncover very often people who've been doing perhaps one thing at Newsweek who could suddenly do something quite different and uh, really thrive. Right. The uh, metabolism of, uh, of the being on the Internet is it's just a much faster-paced existence, as I have learned in the brief time <laughs> since I left the Washington Post. Let me get a break, and we'll talk more about the Internet and the impact uh, that, that, will, uh, that this whole merger will have on the Daily Beast in just a moment. We're back talking about the merger of Newsweek and the Daily Beast. And Tina Brown is somebody who has now worked for the Beast for all of one month. Uh, I've been struck by the fast pace of the operation. Uh, are you worried that in swallowing these 250 or so employees from Newsweek that this will change the character of the website? Uh, big institutions, and I worked for one for 29 years at the Washington Post, uh, tend to move a little slower than do uh, smaller operations. Well, not at but all. Don't because... speak of swallowing. <laughs> oh, sorry. Don't speak of swallowing anybody. Wrong verb. All right. <laughs> We're not swallowing at all. We're, uh, I'm not at all daunted by having, uh, you know, a, a two operations in this sense at all. I mean, uh, the fact is that uh, the Daily Beast uh, has its own great momentum, and it will continue to, to have that momentum, and nothing will change that. All it will happen, actually, is that the two merged staffs will have a chance to work for both. And... That, I think, is exciting to everybody. There will be new writers and old writers who come who, at Newsweek who now have a very thriving uh, digital outfit for their uh, material. And there will be editors who come from print at the Daily Beast who uh, will be able to develop ideas at greater length that can then see their way into Newsweek. So as I see it, it will be a very much more, uh, it will be a nimble, as nimble as ever, bringing some of that nimbleness to the print side. And the print side, of course, is going to bring a, a great deal to, to the website. So. I, I'm not at all daunted by that at all. In fact, what's great about it is it, it kind of fixes one issue right from the beginning where so many uh, print magazines are struggling to think, well, what is their, their website piece of it going to be? That part of it is fine. Now I can really focus on turning around Newsweek and bringing this magazine back to its, its glory, really. I mean, it, it is a great global magazine. People forget that. You know, it has an amazing whole uh, worldwide imprint, That's Newsweek. Right. It really does. And it's very exciting. In fact, I met with the editors of Polish Newsweek, which is an enormously successful magazine and the most successful. They are so talented on Friday. I mean, I was blown away by what they showed me. It really showed me the richness, the depth. Uh, the global reach that Newsweek is as a magazine. Let's leave a little time for Sydney Harmon. Howard. Go ahead, Sydney. 
I've been around long enough to see the premature burial of such renaissance, renaissance giants as Apple and Ford, and I believe that with Tina and her partners, great Barry Dilla and this cool cat, this kid of 92 years of energy and curiosity, we look to a very bright future. Do you spend much time on the internet yourself, Sidney Harmon? I spend a great deal of time on the internet. It's been clogged recently by bulletins and emails <laughs> from my editor-in-chief, <laughs> but I'll get through that. After all, I think of Newsweek as a national institution. I think of myself as a national treasure. I ought to be able to manage some internet activity. All right. Well, you've got a modest partner there, Tina Brown. We've got. To, I have uh, to say, keeping up with Sydney is going to be my issue. This guy is a dynamo, I tell you. <laughs> All right. Well, it's an interesting courtship to follow. Uh, everyone is going to, including me, is going to want to see how the marriage works out. Tina Brown, Sydney Harmon, thanks very much for joining us.